between them, between Babylon, the first and the second angel, is the everlasting gospel. The first thing we're told about that first angel is he has the gospel. This is God's way of salvation. We're going to come back to that at the end. We're almost there. God's way of salvation is the gospel. Salvation here is man-made and built on human ambition and pride. Salvation here, or standing here, is this not great Babylon that I have built? End time Babylon, we should be looking for the same thing. Man-made, rooted in, in idolatry, uh, uh, lots of uh, ambition, and a desire to usurp the place of Jesus and his high priestly ministry. That's what we're looking for, okay? But the gospel, the gospel is the very first thing we're told about the first angel. Now look at this. This is just absolutely mind-blowing. And for me, it's proof positive that the Bible is inspired. People ask me all the time why I believe the Bible, and here's the shortest answer I can give. After having spent thousands and thousands of hours reading and studying the Bible for myself over the last 20 years, here's the number one reason I believe the Bible. Are you ready for this? The number one reason I believe the Bible is the Bible. The Bible is phenomenal. It is, it is absolutely multi-layered in its beauty and yet its complex simplicity, and I put those words together purposefully, complex simplicity, the revelation of Jesus, the uninventability of Jesus, the prophecies of Scripture. I am very much of the persuasion that anybody that is willing to genuinely open their heart to God and humble themselves before God that comes to Scripture and just studies it, just reads it, will be persuaded of the truthfulness of Scripture. Now, I don't just, I don't, I'm not saying that's the only evidence that I believe. Oh, no, there's confirmational evidences all over the place. My own experience, archaeology, prophecy, science, tons of confirmational evidences that Scripture is God's Word. But the number one reason that you should believe the Bible is the Bible. It has a self-authenticating quality to it. And check this out. Just, just look at this. As a case in point, that you could have never written this, you could have never invented this, you just couldn't, Da Vinci couldn't have pulled this off, Tolstoy couldn't have pulled this off, Hemingway couldn't have pulled this off, the greatest artists and composers and, and uh, novelists could never have done this, right? Especially not over a period of some 1,500 years, right? On three continents, the Bible was written by some 40 different people. It's just not gonna happen. When it comes together and it coalesces into this marvelous tapestry of God's providence and goodness, it's, it is literally a supernatural document. You hold in your hand a supernatural document, and not just any ordinary supernatural document, but a document that is so, that is so plainly and profoundly supernatural that people by the millions laid down their lives because of what's in that Bible. They were like, no, this is so important. I, I would rather die than, than sacrifice or compromise what I believe this text is teaching. You just, I mean, it's not just any ordinary book. It's not just any ordinary claim to supernatural. It's like next level, okay? Absolutely amazing. Am I going to get that back up, Richard, or no? Okay, well, you, you work on that, and I'll work on them. Okay, so check it out. What's, what's going to come up here is going to be, w when he actually gets the slide back up, is going to be six, well, la, 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 let there be light. Well done. Six points of tremendous similarity between Neo-Babylon and end-time Babylon. So check this out. Neo-Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, waged war against God's people. End-time Babylon wages war against God's people. Okay? Symbolized by Babylon, the city, and New Jerusalem, the city. Number two. End time Babylon was, prof uh, Neo Babylon was prophesied against by Daniel, uh, primarily by Jeremiah and Isaiah. Daniel also, but Daniel, by that point, the, it already happened. So prophesied against. Here, the angels are prophesying against Babylon. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. We just read that in Isaiah 21. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. So wages war against God pe God's people is prophesied against and then falls suddenly and decisively. It's fallen, has fallen. Suddenly, boom, happens right now happens quick. In fact, we just read that in Revelation chapter 18. If you've still got Revelation in front of you, just, just read this again. We probably went through it so quick you missed it. Um, look at verse 8, Revelation 18 verse 8, when it's describing the career of end time Babylon. It says, therefore her plagues, that is her judgments, come in one day. Boom, just like that. Done and dusted. It just comes quickly. 
Well, fascinatingly, the, 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 the story of the fall of Neo-Babylon back in the book of Daniel goes like this. You might not even know the story, some of you. It's told in Daniel chapter 5. And Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a guy by the name of Belshazzar, was holding a giant feast, a feast to, to celebrate their various Babylonian gods. And in that feast, they're having this big party. Their city was at, you know, being, being besieged by, by marauding armies, the Medes and the Persians, but they were not worried about that because they had these giant walls and Babylon felt secure. Oh, felt secure. You're still in Revelation chapter 18? Look at this. Um, verse 7. In the measure she glorified herself, she lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I, am, I sit as a queen. I am a widow. I will not see sorrow. Everything's going to be fine. There's a, there's a, there's a self-confidence here, right? And here's what happens in Daniel chapter 5. So there's this great big feast, and in, in, in this great big feast that Belshazzar's holding, the, the armies that are outside of the Medes and the Persians, what they do is they divert the river Euphrates well upstream. They divert the river Euphrates, dam it up, divert it over into a big field, and then downstream, of course, the waters start to go down, and they marched under the gates the riverine gates marched under the riverine gates and t Babylon fell in a single night. Babylon the Great. So it falls suddenly. Just suddenly. Well, look at this. Number four. What happens then? After Babylon falls, then shortly thereafter, after the transition to the Medes and the Persians and, and Artaxerxes says, get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. But that's another story. The exodus of God's people from Babylon. They come out of Babylon. We just read that. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people. Well, that's what happened in the, in the old, in Neo-Babylon. God's people came out of Babylon. Check this out. Number five, when they came out, they came to a newly built city and temple. When God's people come out of Babylon here, the next thing that, that's in Revelation chapter 18, verses 20, or chapters 20, 21, and 22 tell about a newly built city and temple. Jesus said, hey, 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 don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to go build you a place. And then number six, true worship was restored. Now, friends, this is an exact recapitulation of what happened here with Israel under Neo-Babylon. Look at it again. Waged war against God's people, prophesied against, fell suddenly and decisively. God's people come out of Babylon. They come to a new city and a new temple. True worship is restored. That is exactly the tale that's being told in Revelation. And you have no hope, no clue, uh, no hope of understanding it if you don't understand the Old Testament backdrop and context. If this makes sense, say amen. You follow that? It's amazing. Absolutely astonishing. La Rondelle again. Babylon is identified by her opposition to the first angel's message. Well, what does that mean? When you oppose the first angel's message, what are you opposing? That is opposition to both the everlasting gospel and the sacred law of the creator. So when we come down here, and we're going to try to figure out in two nights who is this end-time Babylon and what's going on, we're going to, now we're talking about the imagery and the theology of it, but we'll come back on, on, on um, two nights and we'll just tear the imagery right off. We'll just tear the symbolism off and say, okay, what is this? And you'll see it's just as plain as can be. But it has to be something that is opposing the everlasting gospel and God as creator. The king of Babylon employed, oh yeah, this is, this is crazy, crazy. So Belshazzar, the night that Babylon fell, in his drunken stupor, instant idiot just at alcohol, he's like, I've got a great idea. I've got a great idea. When my, when my granddad Nebuchadnezzar whacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, he carried out many of the gold vessels and instruments that were used in the worship of Yahweh. Bring me the vessels that were used in the worship of Yahweh. This is the story told in Daniel chapter 5. Bring me those vessels. So those vessels are, somebody goes and finds them in the treasure house of, the, of Babylon, brings them out to, to Belshazzar, and in an act... Of, of thorough uh, human ambition and pride and folly, he fills those vessels, holy vessels, that were made by the Levitical priests and, and under the direction of Moses and Solomon and that were then placed into the very holiest place in all of Israel's economy. Those were brought out, bloop, 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 filled up with pagan wine and drunk to the pagan gods and goddesses. Look at this. The king of Babylon employed the gold vessels from God's sanctuary to praise idols. This idolatrous act marked the end of probation for Babylon and brought on her doom. God's like, okay, you're done. You're done, you're done, you're done. 
Well, check this out. When we come down to end time Babylon, similarly, end time Babylon holds a golden cup in her hand and aspires to be God's representative on earth. Now, that, that, that imagery of a cup will become very important for us, and I'll give you just the littlest hint of hints. Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 gave to his disciples, and he said, take this cup and drink from it all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you, for many, for the remission of sins, okay? Now, here's a fascinating little insight. Jesus didn't drink out of that cup. I don't know if you knew that or not. He didn't drink it. He didn't drink any of that cup. He gave it to them to drink because just a few hours later, Jesus drank out of his own cup, the cup that he said three times, Dad, I don't want to drink out of this cup. I don't want to drink out of this cup. I don't want to drink out of this cup because what was in that cup was not the cup of communion and connection. That was the cup of wrath and separation, okay? So you have this whole idea of the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus. In other words, it's a holy thing. It's a holy thing used for a holy purpose, right? But in the same way that Belshazzar used the vessels of God for, to, for his own idols and for his own nefarious purposes, the, the hint here in Revelation is that this end-time Babylon will also bring out the uh, cup of Yahweh and use it in an idolatrous way. Hmm. Just a little hint. Hang on to that. We'll come back to that in two nights. Hans La Rendell, final quote from him. When people drink this wine, the fundamental distinction between the creator and the creation, between the holy and the profane, becomes blurred in the people's minds. They're drunk. Oh, creature, creator. The worshipers of the beast will honor the creature more than the creator, and not in the way that you might be thinking. I will come back to this quotation. The worshipers of the beast will do something that elevates the creature and I'll just put a little finer point on it here, that elevates man even above the creator. This is the essence of idolatry. In their confusion about the distinction set by the creator, men are led to rely on human traditions, and where human traditions fail, political power to secure peace. Okay, and we'll unpack this in greater detail. You're getting there. Jesus confirmed that this is exactly what would happen. This is not only a revelation thing. This is straight out of Jesus' own testimony. Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus was describing what it would be like at the end of time, he said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Because remember the universal scope of Babylon. Babylon is universal. Who can make war with Babylon? Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. A prophet is somebody who purports to speak on behalf of God. People will be speaking on behalf of God that will deceive lots and lots of people. Lawlessness will abound. That is to say, God's law will be lost sight of. Lawlessness. The love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And what is the, what is the point? What is the, what is the essence and the point of conflict between Babylon and Israel, end time Israel? This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus and Revelation point to the gospel as the point of division and hostility between God and Babylon. The first angel's message has the everlasting gospel. The second has a cup, a purportedly divine cup, but it's filled with inebriating substance. God says, fallen, fallen, just like Daniel chapter 5. Bring out the cup of Yahweh, fallen, fallen. Happens in one moment, happens in one night. What is this gospel? Well, we've been over this. The better question is not what is the gospel, but what? Who is the gospel? Very good, excellent. Hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel, Ellen White says. The gospel is the incomparably good news that God looks like Jesus and salvation has come to earth. Jesus is the good news that you have access to God by going to Jesus. Well, how do, we, how do we do that? There might be people here tonight that are like, how do you do that? How do, you, how do I come to Jesus? Well, it's really easy. Two syllables, one word. You believe. You believe that God has manifested himself in Jesus and that he has done what you have not done and could never do. You believe it. You believe it. This is not human pride and human ambition. This is God's humility and condescension. Look at this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, what's the word? Believe. Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 11. If you confess with your mouth and what? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and what? Believe, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Look at this. 
For with the heart, one, what does the heart do? Believes. Believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes, believes on him will not be put to shame. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed. you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe, believe in him whom he has sent. The gospel is not something you do or something you attain to. The gospel is something that you believe, or more precisely, is someone you believe in. That is the gospel. Believe the gospel. It says confession is made with the mouth, belief is done in the heart, and when you do that, you believe you will not be put to shame. Friends, the, 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 it just drives me crazy. The end of time is not going to be about how much canned food you have stocked away. It's not going to be about how many generators you have or all of that. You're welcome to do that. You are welcome to do anything and everything you can. I think it's actually probably good advice in a day and age when people don't grow much of their food anymore. It's probably a wise thing to have some food tucked away because, you know, if a supermarket, well, they say, I think I read somewhere that supermarkets basically have four days worth of food in them or five days worth of food in them. So it is a good idea if you don't have your own garden and you're not canning your own food, you should stockpile some food. You know, it sounds kind of, you know, conspiratorial and sort of apocalyptic, but it's just common sense, right? Just common sense. And today's, you know, uh, folly is yesterday's wisdom. And, and basically, in a century ago, you had whole root cellars that were just full, full of canning. My grandmother, man, when I was growing up, they were always canning stuff, canning peaches, canning tomatoes, canning beans, canning, 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 right? My advice to you, yeah, you should probably do something because you live in really weird, difficult times and everything from a natural disaster to a terrorist attack or something else could happen, and you might not just have easy access, oh, I'll just run down to Whole Foods and pick me up, you know, well, whatever. That might, those days might not be ahead of you, but here's the key. That has nothing to do with how or why you are saved. Amen. Nothing. No conspiracy. It doesn't matter if you think that you know who blew up the Twin Towers 9-11. Fine and good. You can, be a, you can believe the party line or you can be a conspiracist. Fine. Nothing to do with how you are saved. Nothing. There are people that are, oh, it's right down to the end of time. It's gonna, it, it, God is not saving smart people. It's not like, hey, you better pass the theology quiz that's coming at the end of time. You'd better be able to find these texts. And based on the fact that none of you could give me four out of the five markers of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, you're all in great big trouble. God is not saying you'd better be really smart at the end of time because I'm saving smart people who know all the right answers to the heavenly quiz. You will be saved on one thing alone, and that is the gospel. Believe Jesus Christ. He's done what you have not done. He died the death that you deserved. He lived the life that you have not lived. And his resurrection is your only hope of resurrection. But here's the good news. It's not a, it's not a stringy hope. It's not a maybe hope. It's not a hope. hopefully it works out hope. It's a firm hope. It's a solid hope. If you put your faith in Jesus, you will be saved. Guaranteed. As we already talked about. For the Jews, resurrection was an end of history event. But, but Jesus took that end of history event and plopped it right down the middle of history so you could have total confidence that God has the sin and death thing, sin and death thing, tsh, sorted. Tsh, grab those two arrows off the devil, sin, tsh, took care of that. Grab the death an, an, uh, arrow off the enemy, tsh, broke that. Tsh, 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 Jesus raises from the dead. So you can be like, whoa, Jesus raised from the dead? Jesus raised from the dead? I'll put my faith in that guy. It's not something you attain to or something that you get better and better at. You believe the gospel, and a really cool thing happens. When you believe that Jesus has done what you could never do and have not done, when you believe he died the death you deserved and lived the life you haven't lived, and his resurrection is your only hope of a future resurrection, when you believe that, your life begins to be changed. But here's the key. That amazing change that happens in your life where you go from drunk to sober and non-smoker or sm smoker to non-smoker and liar to honest and porn addict to pure and uh, unfaithful to faithful, that transformation that takes place in your life, that is not the grounds of your salvation. That's the fruit of your salvation. That doesn't happen to you so that you can be saved. That happens to you because you're being saved. 
okay? And if you put that cart in front of that horse, if you get that wrong, and I tell you, there's a whole lot of people who get that part wrong, they get, and they get discouraged. They get, there's only two possible outcomes if you try to be saved by your own efforts, energies, and works. Only two possible outcomes. Total despair, at which point you will leave the church and leave God, or total deception, at which point you will become a Pharisee and convince yourself that you are something that you are not. Away with despair and away with self-deception. Just believe the gospel. And when you truly, genuinely, in your heart of hearts believe that God gave everything for you and that there's nothing you can do to earn it, there's nothing that you can do to win it, there's nothing that you can do to attain to it, then your marriage will be changed, your life will be changed, your, your, ment your thought life will be changed, your checkbook will be changed, your energies will be changed. You will become a reflection of the thing that you believe. And so, friends, I plead with you, the great dividing line, the great, the great San Andreas fault that runs between the first and the second angel's message and between Babylon and God's people is the gospel. Believe the gospel. You're welcome to stockpile food, and you're welcome to think whatever you want about conspiracy theories, all of that, but don't for a moment mingle that in some, in some humanistic way into the grounds of your salvation. You, I, I gave you like six quotations, could have been 60. You were saved by believing the holy history of the man Jesus Christ, that he lived and died, said the things that he said, did the things that he did, and that he raised from the tomb. And when you believe that, Scripture says, you will be saved. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you that you may continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen? How many of you want to say with me tonight, I believe the gospel. I believe the gospel. Father in heaven tonight, we believe the gospel. And we don't think for a moment that our belief is something that recommends us to you. Our belief is simply the means by which we attach ourselves to the great good news of the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Father, we believe. But we say with that man there in the New Testament whose son was, was in trouble, Help our unbelief. We believe, but help our unbelief. And Father, as we come down to the crucible, to the cusp of the end of time, help us not to think for a moment that it will be anything that we have done or even could do, but it will be a total reliance, a total trust, a total dependence on what you have done in Jesus and what you are doing in Jesus. Father, communicate that to us by the Spirit. We do believe Help us to believe more and to believe better and make us people that look like we believe the gospel. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. All right, it wasn't under an hour. I told you it wouldn't be. All right, so we're going to spend just a few minutes. If you have any questions, like 10 minutes or one minute if you don't have any questions on the book of Revelation. Oh, you're a good man, Charlie Brown. Thank you so much for that, Rick. Oh. It even has a lemony, ooh, you're going to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Okay, we have a, we have a question. Alice, nice and loud. Explain um, what I asked you yesterday about the fractured trip. Okay, so I went over to Alice's house last night, and she made me some food, and it was absolutely delicious. And as if that wasn't enough, then, then her lovely husband agreed to pick up my wife at 4 o'clock this morning. So I'm like... I'm just like your servants. I am, I am your servant. So in answer to your question, what about the, uh, what is the language that Ty used? The broken trinity? The fractured trinity. Okay, fractured trinity. So here's what you have. The picture of God in scripture is that God is not a rigid singularity like there is one cup. God is a plurality. He's a unity of three personalities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is a mystery. It is a mystery, but it is a mystery that is understandable, not fully explicable, but understandable, okay? So that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit came together and decided to create, decided to save. The Bible calls this the Council of Peace, okay? We talked tonight about the counterfeit, the counterfeit, right? So, so here's what happened on the cross. Insofar as it was possible for God to die, He did. Now that's a little philosophical, and I need you to hear it again. Insofar as it was possible for God to experience death, He did. Okay? 
God, by nature, does not have a beginning. He is what is called a first cause or an uncaused cause. He has no origin. He has no initiation. He has no beginning. He always has been, always will be. Okay? So it is a very difficult thing to talk about the thing that is itself life, the fountain of life, the creation of life, the origin of life, as dying. In fact, Scripture says in the book of Hebrews that God cannot die which is why Jesus became a human being so he could die, okay? So some of the big heresies in the church, and not heresies, but some of the big conversations historically in the church were, in what sense was Jesus God? Some believed that Jesus was God only in the sense that he was like a projection, in the same way that there's a projection on that screen, right? Like a shadow, right? Here's my shadow. And Jesus wasn't really like a human. He was like a shadow, like a projection. So when he died, it was like, hey, I'm dying, Okay, well, that's called docetism, or, or st- it was the, the heresy was called docetism, and it was like Jesus seemed to be a human, and he seemed to die. Okay, that was, that's rejected, because he really was a human being, and he really did die. So then others said, oh, so what happened was is that the divine nature and the human nature blended together and created some new nature, and that's what we have. Ah, uh, there's problems with that as well, Okay. What happened was God took on human nature. No one knows what we're talking about here, but I'll do my best to try and explain what we probably do know. Philippians 2 says that he laid aside his divine prerogatives. So omnipotence laid it aside. Omniscience laid it aside. He laid aside those things that make God, God, this is key, in his nature, not in his character. God by nature is all-powerful, omnipotent. God by nature is omniscient. He possesses all knowledge. God by nature is omnipresent. He can be anywhere he wants because he's not bound by time and space. But you and I can't relate to that. We don't have a clue what that means. We, we do not know what we're talking about. All-powerful, we don't have a clue what we're talking about. Omniscient, we don't have a clue what we're talking about. Omnipresent, we don't have a clue. So God knows the only way that Jesus can be the Word, which is the point of communication, is to talk a language that we understand. A language that we understand. And the language that we understand is this language right here. It's flesh and blood language. It's two knees, two feet, a nose on the front of your skull, you know, two hands. This is our language. It's human language. So Jesus becomes a man. Now what happens is, is he does not blend, this is my belief, he does not blend divine and human nature together. He just lays aside, sets down his his divine attributes in terms of his character, but he retains his divine, or excuse me, in terms of his divine nature, but he retains his divine character. So Jesus is walking around. He really is a human being. He's a human, like actually a human being. The word was made flesh, okay? And he could have just reached out and grabbed omnipotence when they tried to betray him in the garden. And he could have reached out and grabbed omniscience to, to know things that others didn't have access to. And he could have reached out and grabbed omnipresence so he could be talking to the woman at the well and be in Jerusalem at the same time. But he didn't. He didn't. That would not have been in keeping with the terms of the gospel because you and I can't do that. That's not a luxury afforded to us. So Jesus is a human, but he's also divine. Now here's what happens. All that's reasonably fine and good. It's already a giant, giant, giant mystery, but here's where it, the mystery gets wrapped inside of another mystery, and that's when he dies. And when Jesus dies, all we can do is go We do not know what's going on there. OK? Now, what we seem to be able to say with a significant degree of biblical certainty is that Jesus' divinity did not die. Okay? He had to become a man in order to die. But he was a man, and insofar as it was possible for him emotionally, physically, psychologically to experience death, God experienced death. Jesus was genuinely terrified. He, wasn't, you know, he doesn't win the Oscar for like, oh, into your hands. I can. No, no, he's not winning an Oscar for a great performance. He was terrified. He was afraid. Insofar as it was possible for him to psychologically and emotionally embrace death, God did. Now, here's what happened. When he died, this goes back to those two cups. He had given the cup of communion to his disciples and said, drink this. This is the cup of union. Communion. You guys get to stick together with God, but I'll be drinking my cup in a few hours. This will be the cup of separation, which is why Jesus said one, two, three times, I don't want to drink this cup. I really don't want to drink this cup. I really don't want to drink this cup. What was in that cup was separation. It was, it was the wages of sin, It was death. And Jesus drank that cup 
That is to say, he embraced the will of his father. And when he embraced the will, uh, his own will too, by the way, when he embraced the, the will of the plan of salvation, he went to the, to the tree, to Golgotha's tree, and he was nailed to that tree. And even though we have records of crucifixions lasting as long as a week, uh, Jesus' crucifixion lasted very short. He was crucified uh, uh, late Friday, is that right? And uh, was raised on early Sunday morning. So he was, he, was dead in, he was dead in very short order, okay, very quick. Within a matter of hours, he was dead. And the reason he was dead very quickly is because he didn't die of physical problems. He died of, he died of a broken heart. He, he, he died because the weight of the sin of the world was laid upon him. And here we have something that we are perfectly, we don't know what we're talking about. We have, we have matter and antimatter touching because God, the source of life, is embracing the absence of life, death. And the best way that we, the, the way that Ty is explaining that is that Jesus psychologically, emotionally, and perhaps at some level ontologically, we don't know, it's a mystery, he was separated from his Father. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was fractured. Now, my personal conviction about that is that Jesus, well, as I've already said, insofar as it was possible for God to experience death, he did. And um, that's what he means. Does that help, Alice? He's, you know, we're talking about something that's, like I say, mysteries within mysteries within mystery. No one understands God, number one. No one, under, no one understands how God becomes a man, number two. No one understands how God dies, number three. So it's like mysteries within mysteries. But insofar as it was possible for God to experience death, he did. And it was emotional, it was psychological, it was authentic. And God's heart was hugely broken. Jesus' heart was hugely broken. And the full inner workings of what's going on in there, we don't know. Where was that text in Philippians? Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Okay, Nathan. Okay, so um, that one that I view, you said that he was omniscient at that time, right? Like the, was, yeah, that's right. Jesus laid aside his omniscience. But, because I thought that he was both divine and... Absolutely. And, and, and the book of John, which focuses on his divinity... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that, I mean, him calling him under the fig tree, like, that no. was his No, absolutely not. Can't be. What that is, is every, t every single time that Jesus is doing something that is miraculous in the New Testament, every time, whether it's a healing or knowing the name of Nathaniel, hey, here comes an Israelite in whom there is no guile, he's doing that through prayer and connection with his Father. Let me say it to you this way. The, the way that it's done is a way that it's available for you to, do, to, to know. In other words, you could get on your knees and pray, and God could say, hey, today you're going to meet somebody, his name is going to be Matthew, and you're going to meet him on the subway. What about when he said, I saw you under the fig tree, like he saw him? God can show a vision of, God could easily give him a vision. That's exactly what would have happened. Je he's, Jesus is praying, he's praying for his disciples, and God's like, here he is. He, in the same way it could happen to you. I, I've had that happen to me. I've, I have prayed earnestly, and God has given me, not outright visions, but pictures of future things, and I meet people, I'm like, whoa, this is amazing, I've seen this before, not like literally in a vision, but God has revealed it to me. No, 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 you see, th there's a major problem here, if we have Jesus walking around as God, looking like a man, well, that doesn't work. By the way, we have that in the Old Testament. Remember when Abraham came out, and he saw three people walking? He saw three people walking, one of those people was Yahweh, was Jesus. One of those people was Jesus, and they came and they had cheese under the fig tree, under the tree there, not the fig tree, but the tree, and they ate together. That's, that's just God coming down, taking the shape of a man. That's not what happened with Jesus. What happened with Jesus is Jesus laid aside omnipotence. The word is divested. He divested omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. He divested himself of that. He was a human being. Now, he could do supernatural things by praying to the Father and, and, and asking for power from the Spirit. But what he, the power that he exercised is a power that's available to you by leaning on your Father and by the, by the infilling of the Spirit. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am, please. He said, I don't say or do anything. That's right. My Father does not. Correct, John 17. Very good. Very good. Please. I just had a question uh, before. Yeah. Revelation. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about them being the way she's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if that group of people that believe that's true, you know, I think so. 
my personal conviction is, is that it contained 12 people from the pre-Christ time. In other words, before the, remember Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said, he said, there's never been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Remember that? He said, but he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. Jesus drew a sharp distinction between all the prophets that looked forward and then him. Remember Jesus said, lots of prophets have desired to see what you're seeing right now. So Jesus made a very sharp distinction between the prophets that were, the people that came before him and the people that came after. So I am very much of the mind that, that the uh, 12 of those people are people from the pre-Christ dispensation, and 12 of them are people who ha- would have had exposure to Jesus um, in, their, in, in, in that short time of, of ministry that Jesus was there, that three years. We know it couldn't have been any of the disciples because they were all still alive, but it could have been others. That's my conviction. I, I couldn't point to a text of that, but it makes sense out of the 12, the 12, the 144. Yeah, but I think Moses is in that number. I think Enoch is in that number. I think Elijah is in that number. You'd be tempted to say that David would be in that number, except that on the sermon in, on the sermon on the day of Pentecost, he says he's not. Great question. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Puts on incorruption. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For the healing of the nations. Yeah. And that we're going to have to have continued access to that tree of life in order to continue. Yep, yep, gotcha, gotcha. So that to me is a uh, contradiction. You know, again, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says immortality. Immortality doesn't say immortality. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a great question. I'd never thought of that before. I think that um, it makes sense to me that I think that God could grant immortality on any means that he wanted. We don't have to eat. He created food. He created digestive systems. There would have been other ways to have sustained life. He's done that clearly, I think, for pleasure. Food is amazing. And, uh, I mean, I had some amazing... I had a cookie just last night that blew my mind. I had another one this morning. So I think that it's not that God couldn't create a self-perpetuating machine or whatever. He just chose to do it with really beautiful fruits that taste good and fall from trees, and so I think it's a, I don't think it's a major point of, of significance. I'm not saying your question is insignificant. I just think that God can do it however he wants, and if I get up there and he's like, hey, you need to eat one of these a day, they taste amazing, by the way, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> okay, maybe one last question, or is that good? Jonathan. So I just... I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit upon we were talking the last time about the in the first angel's message. Yeah. Where it talks about God being the creator. Yeah. Points back to Genesis and also the law that we find in Exodus. Yep, 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 yep. Of God being the ruler of the heavens, the earth, and the sea. See. So what what other ways can we show the importance of Sabbath through Revelation. Through Revelation. Great question. So I think the op- some of the obvious ones are Revelation chapter 10, where it says that he swears and those that, the, for the text that we looked at, you know, the earth and all, is, all that is in them, the sea and all that is in them, and the air, this, um, um, heavens and all that are in them. Then you have Revelation chapter 14, which, by the way, Revelation chapter 14, take a look at this. This is the single largest verbatim quotation of the Old Testament in the, in the book of Revelation. It's in verse 7. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of judgment has come. Here it is. And worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. That is a direct quotation from the Septuagint version of the fourth commandment. It's, it, it's, it is the single longest. Like today we saw Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That's straight out of Isaiah 21. This is straight out of Exodus 28 to 11. I mean, it's unmistakable. 
that this is a reference to the Sabbath. So you have Revelation chapter 10, which is a reference to the Sabbath. You have Revelation chapter 14, which is a reference to the Sabbath. Then you have Revelation 21 and 22, which is the new heaven and new earth, which we know from Isaiah 66 is going to be built on a sabbatic cycle. And then another thing that I find persuasive personally is the repeated emphasis on the commandments of God. So Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12. And then here's an interesting one, and we'll look at this tomorrow night. Those that receive the mark of the beast... Um, scripture says they have no rest. They have no rest. And so, the, and, and it really makes sense, actually, that Sabbath would be right at the heart of this great controversy because it's the thing that, that points us to God as creator, to God as redeemer, and Satan would want to do everything he could to obscure that, and lo and behold, it's been hugely successful in church history. The Sabbath, the Seventh-day Sabbath, began to be lost sight of as early as the second century in Christianity. There's numerous reasons for that that I won't go into right now, but it, we should almost be expecting the Sabbath to show up when we get to the end of time, and so you have all of these textual markers in Revelation that are astonishing, and I'll share with you, um, no, that's a little different thing. So those are some good markers. All right, hey, thanks guys. Let's, uh, we already prayed, so go get some food, and I'll see you tomorrow night.